Welcome everybody. We have a statement here toward the end of the chapter Pure Being which says, why do you think the Master made it so clear that the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there and is not to be found in holy mountains or in holy temples but within you. And I think we can face that question and say, have I really accepted it? Have I really accepted a kingdom of God within me? Or do I still seek my supply my love, my truth, my things, my life in the outer. Or do I accept the kingdom of God is within me and that I seek it within me <coughs> for the purpose of getting better things in the outer? Is that my error? You have to answer these questions to yourself because we learn that there is only one power that can save an individual from self-destruction. And it is the Christ. There is no way to know God aright except through Christ. And you cannot find Christ external to your being. Christ the kingdom of God within you and unless you are in that kingdom how can the treasury of that kingdom flow as your experience what's the point of seeking supply out there when the kingdom of God is within you What's the point of seeking happiness out there or even health out there if the kingdom of God is within you? We forget about that. But I think our greater error is that we're willing to accept it and then we want to go to the kingdom within with a preordained plan of what we want. And we're determined that there must be a way for that kingdom within to give me this that I want. And so, completely heedless of all the admonitions of Scripture, we roll out this hoop and we say, God, jump through it. Here's the will in me that I would like you to fulfill. We even go so far as to pretend to ourselves that we're not doing that. We say, I'm really going to God, well, really not for this or that, but I'll rest there and who knows, something might come that is just what I need. Always there's the idea of, I know what I need. And whether you face it or not, as long as you have that belief that you know what you need, there is in you a quality that is trying to tell God what to do, whether voiced or expressed or conscious. There is something in you that is ticking away 
trying to run the universe of God. And you can notice this when you meditate, because you're not at peace. You sort of screwed around to a certain position in your consciousness, which is trying to nudge God in a certain direction. And you all know exactly what I mean. Now, that is another way to prolong the inevitable self-destruction. You might get a glimmering of truth that way, but the merest glimmering. If you have not been able to attain the fruits of meditation, it's because you have violated the request of meekness, a certain kind of humility. It is really the humility of the acceptance that God is the only being present. It is a complete absence of you and a complete presence of God. And as long as there is in you a desire for anything, there's a you there. And there won't be any fruitage. You might as well face that. There can be no fruitage as long as there is a you. And even though that may seem to be a paradox because the only reason you're studying spiritually is to help a you, it is the you that is invisible, which is the child of God. It needs none of the things you are seeking And to experience that you, the you that is seeking, must step aside. Now when you go up to the Mount of Olives, you ascend the mountain of consciousness, and it's called a Mount of Olives because the olive is a symbol of the fruitage or fertility that is made manifest through receptivity to the word. And so as you ascend high consciousness, which in the Bible is called the Mount of Olives, you're ready to receive divine wisdom, divine substance. But it won't flow it won't flow if you are denying the presence of God at the same time. Very subtly, you deny the presence of God when you try to mount higher consciousness with a doubt, with a fear, with a human purpose. Because, you know, if you are accepting the presence of God, as a reality where you are, would you not be in total peace? And if you were in total peace, you would discover that the word flows. When you come into meditation and do not bring peace with you, you have set up the barrier. But when you bring peace with you, it is because you have done certain things. First of all, you have looked past the problem that confronts you. And that was your acceptance of the presence. And you can look at that problem in every direction that it comes from and in every form and degree that it expresses toward you and in you and around you, and you must surmount it, attaining an inner peace before you enter your meditation. You think you're going to meditation to get the peace, 
but you must bring the peace to the meditation. It's quite surprising when you do. In the middle of all this that confronts you, you find the oasis of peace within, and you come to the Father with that peace, which is your acceptance that the Father is present, that the power of the Father is present, the love of the Father is present, and you are confident that that love is present. You are trusting that love to be present. You are trusting God to be alive where you are. It takes maybe five minutes to discover that all you have missed when you have come into meditation was that you didn't bring the peace to that meditation. It seems like such a simple thing to say and yet when you do it, lo and behold, a veil lifts. Try it now and you'll see. Let everything go. Convince that intellect that it doesn't have anything it needs to hold on to. That you're here to bring the peace of acceptance. That is the house in which you invite the Father to enter to express. <coughs> that is all you do. And as you bring your peace, the Father gives you his peace. As you pour the little oil in your cruise, it continues to flow. And then my peace I give unto you. You have accepted the presence of the Prince of Peace, the Christ within, who goes to the Father. And in that oneness, you find the peace that you brought comes back to you. Multiply. Infinite. You're in your Mount of Olives. such a little thing to overlook and such a big thing when you remember it. Whenever you meditate without first bringing the peace to that silence, you have separated yourself from the very power you are trying to contact. I've had times when I felt separated and then in the moment of realizing that I would be in peace if I really accepted the presence, it may be a borrowed peace at first, but at least you make the effort. And then lo and behold, in that peace you're really saying without words, speak farther, Thy son heareth. And your inner peace is really the still water. The repose that makes possible the flow of the infinite. There was nothing you had to predetermine. Nothing you had to outline. All you had to do was present yourself as a disciple of the peace, in spite of every appearance, and the world is lifted from your shoulders.
Joel said, it is still true that Moses can lead his flock only to the promised land, but cannot take them into it, that they must do it for themselves. And later the master confirmed this when he said, if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. And by comforter he meant that which completes your demonstration, the full peace, the fulfillment of your destiny. And so we find that the reading about Jesus Christ, the talking about Jesus Christ, the being a student of the infinite way or any other way, all of this is but preparation for the moment when you come in total peace willing to transcend all of the complexities of the world around you and in total acceptance of the living presence to bring that peace and rest knowing that is the way you enter the kingdom of God on earth where the comforter completes your destiny makes you whole reveals the perfection that surrounds you in the invisible making it manifest in the visible always the peace you bring is one of the missing links that has barred you from the kingdom that is why we so strenuously work at the letter of truth at the metaphysical side of this work to come to a place where we can banish the belief in evil where we can look through the images, where we can judge not after the appearances and judge no man. When we are not fooled by the traps of worry, fear, despair, and terror. Those are just the obstacles in this course. God is only in the still small voice. Where then will you go for God? The secret of the infinite way, says Joel, is revealed in the truth that the only God there is is consciousness a living God infinitely conscious a divine consciousness that covers all time and space now That is the God presented in the infinite way, living, divine, infinite consciousness. But this God, this consciousness, is your only real consciousness. You're never separated from it. It's always present. It's always doing its job. And most of us are always denying just that, that it is present, that it is doing its job, because I see something else. And I believe what I see.
And then I lose that peace, that trust, that confidence, that awareness of the presence, and I'm back in the jungle of the senses, struggling, fighting to overcome. And there's nothing there but the pure consciousness of God. All else is non-existent. There's only one consciousness, and this is the consciousness of God, which is the consciousness of individual man. We deny that every moment. The slightest tremor of doubt or fear in you is a denial that there is only one consciousness. And so you're in a second consciousness or a sense of consciousness. But it isn't the pure consciousness and therefore it has no real existence. It isn't something that is real It isn't something that is there. You're caught in an image. You're caught in another sense of life than the pure consciousness. You're in a web, but it isn't a web that is real. Only pure consciousness exists. Pure being. I is the secret name of God and it is consciousness and when you turn anywhere but to the withinness of your own being you are turning where it is not and so I think we can all agree that the withinness of our own being, the divine consciousness, the infinite consciousness, is the only place where there can be a substance called life. And to seek our needs anywhere else is to fall into the trap of a mortal sense of life. Now let's presume we have passed that point and that largely it is behind us at least intellectually and we have trained ourselves to some extent to not only live in the withinness three times a day upon rising and sometimes in the midday and sometimes before going to sleep but that with us it is now a normal procedure to live in the withinness throughout the day. The meditation periods with the eyes closed are within, but the periods throughout the day with the eyes open are also lived in the within, in the peace, within the stillness of peace, which is the acceptance that no matter what I see makes no difference, no matter what experiences come my way make no difference, my function is to live in the conscious awareness that here is the pure consciousness of God functioning with divine power with divine omniscience maintaining perfection in all things and it makes no difference to me what appearances may come forth this peace this assurance is the way you live in that consciousness throughout the day, eyes open or closed. Being still, within, peaceful within, knowing it is I, always. It is I, present. And that which you have which denies the presence of that perfection is not something to be fought but to be seen as a non-existence and step back a moment from it until you can feel it as an image and thought until you can really accept God so that in a moment 
as you leave the appearance in mind and let the still small voice be your only weapon, your only goal, your only seeking, knowing that the full, complete, and total power of the spiritual universe flows through that still small voice, that it can dissolve whatever confronts you and transform your world into his kingdom now and here. This must be our conscious, consistent attitude. <coughs> I think to a degree we've had days like that, maybe weeks at a stretch in which we could feel that even though at this moment I cannot say that I am touching the presence or that it is touching me, we're in a state of oneness that I can accept, where there is no touching necessary. I don't have to sit here and feel the presence any more than I have to feel the sun to know that it's outside. I don't have to waste my time trying to feel that presence because the fact is that the presence is all there is. There's nothing for me to feel but to accept. And the mind which is still trying to feel the presence is really rejecting it. It is trying to persuade itself that it wants to feel the presence but what it is saying is I'm not accepting that it is here. It goes right on pretending to itself that it wants to feel the presence. What it is saying is, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the child of God. The child of God doesn't have to feel it. The child of God is the presence. The tricks of the mind are always to defer to delay, to turn away from the total submission to the fact that I am the presence. I'm not something apart from the presence, it is I. There's nothing to be felt, simply to stand in the peace and know, it is I. There's no power to be exerted. The presence is doing its job. There's someone there where you're standing who isn't accepting that when you are not experiencing the fruit of chocolate. Now, if you're still not convinced that only by accepting the presence of God within you as your name, your substance, your life, with no extra, no second, no opposite, but you're simply prolonging your problems, Joel must remind you further that if you have not learned from the message of the infant way that the only real good you're ever going to receive is from within your own consciousness, then you have failed to perceive the nature of its mission and its message which is that God consciousness constitutes your consciousness. There are not two. That through meditation you must draw forth from within your own consciousness the allness and fulfillment of life. You are not to direct this eye, to enlighten it, or to plead with it or try to be master of it. You are to submit and yield yourself a servant to the eye of your own being. Letting this I, which is your true selfhood, govern your life in its own way.
So when you go into prayer and meditation, there must be no preconceiving as to what you want or how you wish your prayer to be answered. And when you say, not my will, but thine be done, if it's of the mouth and not the heart, you'll find that you're deceiving no one but yourself. Now, we're going to look at the 8th chapter of John because some of this rubs off into this chapter. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. Watch how that complete, seemingly insignificant statement is transformed as you see the purpose behind John's bringing it here as chapter 8. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Way, way up into consciousness so that all he could speak would be absolute truth. Now you know this is a permanent state of his being. It isn't as if he suddenly sat down and decided to meditate. But John is pointing out that this is the state of his being. That he speaks from the Mount of Olives. In other words, only divine wisdom flows through him. He is the mouthpiece of God. It is the Mount of Olives because the words that he speaks, when they become flesh, they are the spiritual fruitage. They are the olives. This is the message that proves itself. The word of God through Jesus proves itself. It isn't the word of men. It's from the Mount of Olives. From the high consciousness in direct cognition of God. From the oneness realized. Early in the morning, he came down again into the temple. Now what temple? He appeared visibly. In the invisible, in the highest dimension of consciousness, in the one came the message, flowing through into the visible or the temple called Jesus. And so what he's about to speak is the living word of God. And all the people came unto him, meaning all those who wanted truth, all those who loved truth. And he sat down and taught them. Now this sitting down is a symbol of the peace we talked about. This is in repose. When you sit down spiritually, it means you have found your peace. And from the level of peace he spoke to them. The Mount of Olives made possible the flow of love. And this love flowed forth giving wisdom. And in peace he sat and taught them the wisdom that flowed from the love of the Father. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Now, it is important at this particular moment to see that John put this here for a certain reason. Most of the Bible 
experts believe that this is placed out of chronology and I'm quite sure it is they place it in Luke that it probably happened after Luke 22 38 and the reason for that is because Luke had just reported the conversation between the disciples and Jesus concerning the end of the world and this end of the world discussion misunderstood so infuriated the Pharisees that they're now trying to in some way challenge the authority of the man who was speaking about the end of the world and so undoubtedly John took this discourse which happened at that point and brought it into this point but he wanted it in this continuity to teach us something else now describes in the Pharisees who feel their own authority is being threatened come to him with the purpose of forcing him into a position in which he denies the law of Moses and I want you to see the adultery message in a somewhat different light than we've ever discussed it from the mystical side and from your practice during the week in which you were able to know that there is nothing external to your consciousness and that whatever appears outwardly is in your consciousness and that if your consciousness is one with the divine that which appears within your consciousness will not appear to you as evil if you have been practicing that you can see now that as the scribes and Pharisees present the adulteress to Jesus they are seeing one thing and he is seeing another they are seeing the woman out there they are unaware that what they are seeing is in their consciousness he is seeing the woman in his consciousness not out there And because he is one with the Father and is the actual expression of the essence of God there is something happening there that should become normal for you and I we should be able to see that adulteress as he saw her over here are the enraged Pharisees over here is the adulteress and they're really one life one invisible Christ life and yet in the images one image is accusing another image even though all that is there is the invisible Christ life and that invisible Christ life is also over here in a third place and it manifests as Jesus the Christ and that invisible Christ life which manifests here as Jesus the Christ is the invisible Christ life of the adulteress and of the Pharisees <coughs> and the only witness of it is the one called Jesus but who are these Pharisees it's the mind of us your mind and mine who is the adulteress 
It's the image in mind that we all have when we see the adulteress. And who is this Jesus? It's the Christ of us. And so the entire scene is our consciousness, which is separated from God, and our consciousness, which is unseparated from God. The Pharisees being one, and Jesus the Christ being the other. One looks at the image within itself and calls it an adulteress. The other looks at the image within itself and calls it the Christ. We're being brought into a big step out of the Old Testament, into the New. You see, we're most of us in this world still living in what we call the 20th century with all our advanced technology, but actually we're living 35 centuries ago in the Old Testament. We're still living in the beliefs that were prevalent in those days. The mind of us, the intellect of us, still lives in the Old Testament. It sees that which it condemns. It judges. The Pharisees are living under the veil of the sense mind. They see an adulteress. The sense mind in us sees a thief, sees an adulteress, sees a problem sees a lack, sees a limitation. This is no ordinary adulteress. This is a symbol of the problems that confront us through the sense mind. You can take anything in your world that is imperfect, and that's the adulteress you're looking at in this passage of chapter 8. <coughs> Your mind is identifying a non-existent, but it's very real to your mind. The Pharisees are enraged. The human mind is afraid or worried or concerned or troubled. In some way, it is accepting the appearance of imperfection. But you see, the reason they are coming to Jesus with this particular adulteress is not because they really hate the sin she's committed, not because they want her to be judged righteously. They have an ulterior motive. He has introduced the idea of divine truth. Christ in you introduces the idea of divine truth and the human mind rebels. Doesn't want it. And even if it pretends it wants it, it is afraid to accept it. And so it tries to trap the Christ in you. And in this case, the human mind throws an adulteress at his feet says to the Christ, now what are you going to do? They're not really accusing her of adultery. They're challenging his authority. Because now he has to make a decision. Will he break the Mosaic law? And that's what your human mind finds it's trying to do in many cases. How do I know Christ is that powerful? How do I know Christ can take me to the right place? How do I know Christ is a reality? The human mind, the sense mind, the normal mortal intelligence rejects the authority of Christ, even challenges its authority. Your, the human mind says, I've been doing pretty well without you. 
I've been getting along real good. Now what can you do for me that I haven't been able to do for myself? And so the Pharisee has now tossed the gauntlet. The intellect says to Christ, the next move is yours. We've got a human world here and you can't convince me we haven't. We've got problems around us. We've got a human life to live. We've got human bodies. You know, yesterday, I must have had at least 12 phone calls from people who were telling me about just this very thing. While we're still in the body, we do have to watch out for this and for that. While we're still in the body, we have to make this decision and that decision. You see, that's the Pharisee saying to Christ, you told us all about my invisible body, but my present problem is my visible body. My visible business, my visible everything is what I'm concerned about. Now what are you going to do about this over here, this adulteress? Some years back I was given the information within about Jesus riding in the sand making an image of a nothingness and I had nothing to back that up with except the voice within. And in doing this chapter I was led to other things which corroborated that. One of them was in Jeremiah. You'll find that there's this passage they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken adultery in, in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This Mosaic law, you see, is being presented as the law under which man lives. The Mosaic law is material law in disguise. We live under karmic law. And that's what Mosaic law here symbolizes. They don't know that they're living under karmic law and they use it to challenge him. Our karmic law, our Mosaic law, our material law says stone her. And you see, the Christ of us is trying to lift us out of that 3,500 years ago attitude of material law into a new law, into a law of grace. And so while this conversation is going on in your conscious or subconscious mind, there's something happening in which you're challenging the Christ which wants to lift you above your problems and you're insisting in the mind to keep them. We have this, this law, this, this material law. It says if somebody shoots you, you die. It says unless you have at least two good meals a day, you'll die of starvation. These are all laws among us. It says all things about environment and heredity. It says that if germs infect you, you can go through a great deal of suffering. And Christ is being presented mosaic law, karmic law, and that is to be their yardstick. That is the yardstick of the human mind. The human mind lives in its mosaic law. He lives in good and bad. 
It lives in hopes and ambitions. The human mind lives in the personal sense of ego. It's only concerned about what it's going to do in this particular lifespan. That's all it knows. And for it, its lifespan is squashed down between its ankles and its head. And that area between the ankles and the head is where it's greatly concerned. That's where the human ego spends most of its time working. Because it believes in karmic law. And it even thinks that's the law of God. Now watch how deftly he lifts them out of their accusation so that they actually begin to accuse themselves. And watch how this self-accusation is a perfect mirror of what you and I do every day when we are unaware that every condemnation of another person on the face of the earth is our own self-incrimination. John put this here to show us that every time we bring a belief that another somewhere else is in some way responsible for any discord in our life by withholding something from us that we want or by in some way jeopardizing our life we are denying the very presence of the oneself the Pharisees saw an adulteress they didn't see the oneself there was just somebody between the head and the feet standing over here saying that one between the head and feet over there is an adulteress and we still live in that state of mind of 3500 years ago in spite of the fact that here 2000 years ago one could say no that's the oneself over there that you're calling an adulteress don't you realize that all there is is the one self everywhere? So you've just looked at your own self and said you're an adulteress. You've just looked at your own self and said you lack. You looked at your own self and said you're limited. You're looking at God everywhere and saying God doesn't have this and God doesn't have that. All trapped in the mirror of the mind. He's not telling us a story about Pharisees accusing an adulteress at all. Those are the props. He's showing us that as long as external to us we think there's something there that isn't the one pure perfect self called God, which is yourself. You're simply putting yourself on the stand and indicting yourself thinking how self-righteous I am that that one over there is at fault. That one over there is making the mistake, not me. But that one over there is you. And until you know that that one over there is you, you go right on incriminating yourself. No one over there is withholding anything from you because it's you over there. And when you know that the only one over there is the one in your consciousness, you have removed the appearance of the adulteress. And why does it happen to be an adulteress? Because the human mind is an adulteress. The human mind is an adulteress.
It is an adulteress in the fact that it is not married to God. Now we see these people here are seeing a physical adulteress and in the doing of it they are committing spiritual adultery. There is no moral issue here in this chapter. That's the way it's been translated. The only issue here is a spiritual issue. As the Pharisees accuse the adulteress, as the mind finds something in the physical world that is not right, the mind is in adultery. It is not seeing the one indivisible spirit of God, which is all that is present. And in that spiritual adultery, we are all guilty of separating ourselves from God. To answer this, Jesus stooped down. And to teach us, with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now watch how tenderly he treats even the accusers of the adulteress. He does not accuse them. He permits them to express themselves and he writes this nothingness into the earth. And in Jeremiah, here's what is said to explain that passage when he writes in the earth with his finger. The passage is 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. They have forsaken the one self. You see that? All that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me, that departing from me is departing from the knowledge of one self everywhere. They that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters to his own disciples later he said be thankful your names are written in heaven but here they had healed you see and their healing was in the knowledge of oneself here the Pharisees are dividing the father's garment they're seeing form, not life. They're turning away from the spirit by division. And so their names are writ in the earth. The mind of us turns away from one and tries to keep us earth bound. What sayest thou, they said? So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up. Now listen, he lifted up himself. A while ago it said he stooped down. He had to reveal the identity of the mortal mind as keeping them earthbound, separated from the one life. And now he lifted up himself, meaning the truth of them 
the transcendental reality of them he knew to be the invisible Christ. The mortal form of them was of the earth. The spirit of them they were unaware of, but he could lift them in the knowledge of their reality. And even while they were accusing the adulterist, he was lifting them up. In other words, the Christ in you does not waver from the one pure truth. All that is present is the one pure truth of God. And just as Jesus resolutely stands there, non-reactive to the accusers, there comes a time in you when the Christ of you is in the uppermost in your consciousness and the world around you is the Pharisees coming to you with a claim. There's the adulteress. Well, there's this or the other thing. And the Christ in you stands and just writes in the ground, meaning mortal mind, nothing else. We who are to follow in these footsteps are to be able to very simply recognize the earthly mortal mind appearance that comes to us and not be persuaded that the absence of God has occurred. And the mortal mind will continue to belabor us with its problem just here as it does here. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, he that is without sin among you let him first cast a stone at her. Now, you can see there were several levels of what would be called sin. First, the ulterior motive. In being completely indifferent to the girl, all they wanted was to upset his authority over the people by making him break the code of Moses. And secondly, you can be sure that they weren't too interested in having the same law apply to themselves. There probably weren't enough stones if that were necessary. But they wanted him. He was their victim. Not her. She was the pawn. And so they were well aware now that he knew their motive, and this was one of the sins they had committed. They were well aware that if they were to absolutely pursue this law, there would be a difficult problem in the kingdom right then of Judaism. If we were to take every corrupt man out of government, we might find we also have a difficult time replacing them. There was an inner corruption in these men, and their own consciousness, their own conscience convicted them. Now, when you face mortal mind in you with the truth of Christ as your identity, as the knowledge of the one self, mortal mind will slowly sink, sink, slink away, just as these Pharisees slowly slink away. 
And so you must face mortal mind with its accusations about the absence of God with the truth in consciousness of one perfect self and you will find that like the Pharisees it cannot face that truth without wilting, dissolving, turning away. There's a higher truth here, somewhat startling. It's very likely that what was happening was the second part of what you were practicing during the week, that when you know that everything is in consciousness only, and you're able to control that consciousness instead of having it control you, you can dissolve the unreal. To an extent, you may have proved that to yourself. The bad health disappears and the good health replaces it. Things of that kind. Here, the people themselves walk away. And you might consider the idea that in the pure consciousness of Christ Jesus, and that if you were able to do the same, so-called enemies would have to disappear. Problems would have to disappear. All things unlike God would have to disappear. For not in consciousness, they cannot remain in your world. To emphasize that these people are of the earth, it says again he stooped down. Every time you see that repetition, that's the emphasis of what he's been teaching. These people are of the earth. Mind will keep you on the earth. Mind will keep you in mortality. Again, he stooped down. This is a statement that mind is inevitably glued to this world. And he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own consciousness, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. You see that Christ vanishes all unlike itself. And the woman standing in the midst. You notice he didn't stoop down twice where she's concerned, but only where they're concerned. They were the accusers. They had the law. They had no right to be ignorant. She was ignorant, misusing her body. They were ignorant, misusing the law. They were guilty of spiritual adultery while accusing her of physical adultery. And the mortal mind of us will fall into just that predicament. It will be consistently in a state of spiritual adultery while it is concerned about its material problems. That very concern is spiritual adultery because it is the loud confession that the Spirit of God is not here. While committing spiritual adultery, you can see that the mind cannot attain contact with the Father or cannot in any way bring you into the kingdom of God. Now, if you can see through this message here, you're finding one of the major barriers to the acceptance and the capacity to live here and now in the kingdom of God. You've got to discover how your mind is committing spiritual adultery. 
It came in making loud statements about this one and that one and the other one doing wrong things. And it was the one who was wrong. Deftly he is turning the accused into freedom while showing her accusers that it is they who are guilty of the greater error. The mind which finds error is guilty of error. The mind in us which finds error is guilty of the greater error. And that error is finding error. The mind that finds error has found what God knows nothing about. You see then the message here of spiritual adultery is the story of the human mind which is always accusing God of placing something in this universe that is not doing its job right. And there is no such thing. On the other hand, to turn around and look at the adulteress and say, neither do I condemn thee, might appear that you're condoning it. But all this is lifting us to the level of looking through the appearance. No matter what it is, because if you can't look through the appearance, your mind is in a state of spiritual adultery. And try as you will, you'll have to pay the price of that adultery. which is a far greater price than all of the physical adultery in the world. It isn't the condoning of that condition, but it's lifting us up to see the greater error that is being committed than physical adultery. And so to her, sin no more, lest a greater evil come upon thee. She in her ignorance has been unfaithful to her husband. They, in their ignorance, have been unfaithful to God. The mind is ever unfaithful to God. Now, if we accept that the mind is unfaithful to God, can we follow that mind? Or must we stoop into the sand and with our finger write, this is a nothing mind. This is a mind that blasphemes the Father. This is a mind that creates a world of mortality, a world of physicality, a world of things where only my spirit is. And so I will not let my mind sin lest a greater evil come upon me. My mind is that adulteress. It must be trained to sin no more, but only to identify the one self everywhere. Because when it finds Christ in itself, I am out of Egypt. I'm out of darkness. I am out of living between the ankle and the head. Your life now stretches out everywhere as far as your mind can go your life is there as a matter of fact one of the most liberating meditations you may ever experience is when you enter the silence with the knowledge that your complete 
total eternal life exists now. It doesn't make any difference if your physical selves appear for another million years. Your total life now exists. And when you rest in that, letting yourself know this truth, you find that your life is a different life than you're living in your conscious daily living. Your conscious daily living is in the life of the mind. And it only is conscious of what it sees around you. But your life is complete already. It isn't this 70 or 80 year span. Your life is a forever life. And there's nothing that's going to happen tomorrow that isn't already in your life. Your total life is not going to be lived, it already is. The knowledge of that takes you right into the now of your life. It's truly a glorious meditation to sit back in the now of your life. <coughs> Many surprising things happen when you do that. Because that life being infinite now isn't going to become something. It isn't a series of new tomorrows. It's a total nowness and the awareness of it brings many things into play. All to this imaged form here that could never happen until the consciousness touches the knowledge of life now extends into millions of so-called human years in every direction. There's nothing to seek in that, just the feeling that knows life is complete beyond this lifespan into many, many lifespans. And you see why peace is so essential. The real life, the real substance, is now. The real life of you is everywhere. The real life of you is infinite. And here the mind of you is concerned about a, a changing image in a changing place, in a changing time. And none of it is you at all. And yet when you're in the one now life of your everywhere, this changing image receives all the benefits. Your total life is now. Such a different place <coughs> than the earthbound mind. more and more you will be of the opinion that you can relax in your total life now with trust. That you can bring your peace to that knowledge and rest there and watch your total life manifest in the changing time picture. This would be trust that God is your life. You've learned that God is everywhere, that God is your life, and so is God going to be something 
more tomorrow than today? Is your life going to really be something more tomorrow? Or are you thinking of this between the head and the toe? Get rid of that image. Your life tomorrow and your life now are identical. And your life eternally is the life that you are now when you accept that eternal life here and now. You won't be riding in the sand. And you won't be accusing God of not being somewhere. And you won't have to face the accusations of the pharisaical ideas in the mind. You won't be limited because your total life now is completely unlimited. And that consciousness can be carried where you walk ultimately with absolute confidence. Your total life is now. Nothing will ever be added to it. All of it is now. We're going to pause a moment, about five minutes. See you shortly. We're not going to try to <coughs> press home too many points. If we can leave today with the knowledge that all life is now and work with that, I can assure you it's another level of yourself that will open up. Now in this chapter, Joel makes the following statement. First you remember he describes the way a, a tree sheds its seed and the sh seed then becomes another tree. And this is what he says about it. In using the tree as an example of life expressing itself, what I want you to see is that you are not the tree. You never were the seed, and you're not the new tree, but you are the life of the first tree, of the seed, and of the second tree. And therefore, your life has been, and is, continuous since before Abraham was. Now you'll notice the complete focus here is not on what's between your head and your toe. The focus here is on the life of you which has been and is and ever will be. All life is now. Your life is never changing. Your concept of it keeps changing, but if you can rest in the knowledge of your life, which is total, which is complete, and get it out of just this little area of time you call your lifespan, see that your life is before Abraham, and that's your life we're talking about, that your life is forever, that your life is the life of God, 
this should be your permanent unbroken consciousness that I am life eternal including within itself all that life is and do you see how the Pharisee mind darts out of that and denies itself to be life eternal do you see how you deny yourself to be life eternal where is your mind on the awareness of your life eternal or upon the pressures of today you can continue in the pressures of today but you'll find they're going to be the pressures of tomorrow the teaching here is transcend the pressures of today because they're only the Pharisee mind accusing God of being absent transcend to the knowledge that the life of God is my life now and rest there and that my life isn't just this particular moment my life isn't being born in a tomorrow and becoming a today life my life exists tomorrow already Tomorrow is just going to flow in here as a mental idea about my life which already is. And every tomorrow is going to be that. And these tomorrows can bring into me very little except what I'm conscious of. If I'm conscious now of my life which is forever, these tomorrows are going to bring in that forever life into my consciousness in manifested form. How different a way to live than to stand here with your bare knuckles and face the pressures of the day. You see how the serpent keeps us bound to the earth, but as we are accepting I am the life, the life of God everywhere in all tomorrows now, and bring the peace to that understanding and rest you're lifting up the I you're becoming conscious of what you are and the eternal life of you can yield into this present moment more of itself through your consciousness of its presence the presence you are to practice is your own eternal life now So Joel continues, the life of God is your life, and therefore your life coexisted with God in, in the beginning, and down through all of the ages of fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, grandparents, great-grandparents, and on into infinity. But always it is the one life which I am. Instead of saying there's an adulteress, you're quietly knowing there is no adulteress. All that's there is the one life. There is no mortal form there. There is the immortal life there. Your knowledge of life pierces the veil of form. And in all the forms you thought were so necessary, are manifested from the level of life rather than from the pharisaical mind or mortal mind. Life manifests not mind. What is the sin then which made the Pharisees slink away? They didn't know it but his knowledge of it made them realize something they couldn't define. They had really 
rejected their own souls. Whenever you are trapped in the veil of matter, you are rejecting your own soul in favor of your mind. Your soul knows the one eternal life that you are. You can live in that. It will feed you. Just be patient while you're living in it. It will feed you. It will protect you. It has a perfect divine plan. It is the power of grace. And every time the lower self, the self beneath the earthbound self, <coughs> makes its claim upon you, stoop down into the sand. Make a little figure meaning nothingness, arm of flesh. Seems so important to that self beneath. But that self beneath with its problems exists only because it is rejecting its own soul. It isn't accepting my total life is now, everywhere perfect as my father. The human mind knows all of the ways to commit physical adultery. And while it's doing that, it is committing the highest sin of committing spiritual adultery 24 hours a day. Don't let it trap you in spiritual adultery because that is the sin which leads to further intensification of your trouble. To the Father, to the divine life be true. There's nothing more to do. Actually, says Joel, I really am the life of all my ancestors. And I'll be the life of all my children, my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-great-grandchildren, because it will be the same life appearing as me as the seed, as my child, as their seed, and as their child. Always it will be I appearing as. And this is my immortality. The immortality of my life maintained as many forms in many generations. And so the good forms, the bad forms, the happy forms, the unhappy forms, They are the images in the mind where only your life is. Then you have accepted God to be pure being and yourself to be pure being. One pure being. So you can tell the spiritual student and you can tell the individual who is the stone in which the seed has not taken root. One is talking about all of this world and all of the problems in it and the other is living in one self, perfect as my father. They might both be appearing in a difficult situation, but one is accepting it and fighting it and worrying and fretting. The other is saying, I and my father are one. There has to come that time when we choose. And then it becomes a permanent way. I and my father are one. And the mind which 
that accuse the father of being absent slinks away. One remains on the field, your Christ consciousness, your consciousness of one pure life everywhere, one pure being. The chapter next week is release man. This week we released woman. I presume there'll be something in it similar to what we've been discussing. Your assignment, if you care to have one, is to pierce the veil of matter around you by the knowledge that where matter appears, only life is. And that the life is never dependent on the matter. The matter may be contaminated, but not the life that is there. The life there is the same pure life that is over there. And all of it is your life. You certainly won't find any adulteresses in your life. You won't find any sicknesses in your life. And if you do, you are not in the consciousness of life. And you are separated from life and you will suffer the consequences of being separated from life because it's the only sin and in that separation evil after evil appears only because life is being denied by the Pharisee mind the human mind Whoever you are, if you will stand on the principle that you are the life that is everywhere now and complete and perfect, all these things that accuse you of pain, lack and limitation will meet the truth in you and slink away. That's the nature of our meditation for the week. God life is now. My total life is already done. It will be forever. I can live in it now. I can live in the totality of it now. Not just this segment. Not this interlude. I can live in the totality of my life now. I must. For that is how I acknowledge its presence. You try that meditation this week. Every time I go into it, the phone starts ringing and never stops. <laughs> Don't be surprised because it really does open a world that is invisible to our human sense knowledge. And the second meditation that I'd like to recommend is that you make it a point never to enter meditation until you have first come to grips with your adversary in the knowledge that I cannot go to God in a state of conflict. I can only go to God in a state of peace. 
And if you cannot attain that peace before you meditate, don't waste your time meditating. If you cannot transcend the appearances and accept the peace on faith, then you have no faith in God. You have no faith in the omnipresence of being. And the chapter pure being is to establish that only pure being is being. Now when you can on faith transcend the circumstances around you, gathering all of your awareness into the peace of knowing the Father is present and perfect now, then go into your meditation and watch how quickly the wings of truth lift you up. Meditations that were fruitless for years suddenly become a magic push button. The moment your faith has let you accept the peace in spite of the war going on around you and in you, you have really come into a state of faith. And that peace will be its own reward. That's the second type of meditation to practice. And I can assure you this last suggestion is something you'll always remember once you have had the success of a meditation in which you first entered in a state of peace in spite of what surrounded you. You wonder, where did everything go? What happened? It's a quick transformation. And the next week we'll do Release Man. For those who will not be here, you can tune in with us during this Easter talk. In the peace. And if you tune in in the peace, you will feel the peace that is here. You'll know you're in the peace because you'll start smiling inside. That's what happens when you're in the peace. Everything in you wants to smile. And so until Easter time, thanks again to all of you who will be here or won't. Happy Palm Sunday. I hope you enjoy this spiritual audio. Like, share and subscribe for more.